Hey, I'm Pastor Rod. Thanks for joining us today. I hope this message makes a difference for you. It didn't start spectacular. Jesus came in a simple way. Paul describes it this way. He had equal status with God, but didn't think so much of himself that he had to cling to the advantage of that status no matter what. Not at all. When the time came, he set aside the privileges of deity and took on the status of a slave, became human. Having become human, he stayed human. Think of what God could have done to communicate his message and reach man. He could have written a message in the sky. He could have used thunder and lightning. God could have invented television 2,000 years early and put a TV in everybody's home. God could do anything. Instead, of all the ways God could have come into this world, he came the same way you and I come, as a baby. The king of the universe, the God who created everything, came as a child, as an ordinary man. If God had wanted to communicate to birds, he'd have become a bird. If God had wanted to communicate to frogs, he would have become a frog. If he'd wanted to communicate to cats, thank God that didn't happen, (laughs) he'd have come as a cat. But God wanted to communicate to you and me, to people. So he became one of us, a man, a baby. And hope entered the world in the humblest of ways. Jesus was a perfect man without sin. But his life was anything but perfect. Jesus experienced pain. He faced loneliness. Jesus dealt with fatigue and pressure. Jesus was disappointed, misunderstood, criticized, mistreated. Jesus was betrayed by one of his closest friends. He was attacked, abused, beaten, and ridiculed. At one of the most stressful times of his life, Jesus' closest followers let him down. No matter what you're going through, Jesus understands. He's been there. God came as a man so he could understand us and we could understand him and be in a relationship with him. What a wonderful, incredible gift. When Jesus was born, he wasn't born in a palace, even though he was the son of God. He wasn't born in a nice hotel or a hospital. He was born in a manger. We don't know exactly where that was. At best, it was a cave or stable. And we glamorize the nativity scene. It looks so wonderful, so beautiful, so peaceful. The cows gaze lovingly at the baby. The sheep lie quietly and provide warmth. That's not the real world. Come on, guys. It was a farm. I've been to farm. Cows and sheep are not peaceful and tranquil. They're rude, ugly, and smelly. When God came to earth, he came with the stench of animals. You can't get any lower than being born in a cave or stable. Baby Jesus was placed in a manger, a feed box for cattle. It was dirty, and it was unsanitary. But that's where Jesus God's son's life began.
the chosen audience for the announcement of Jesus' birth was surprising. An angel appeared to a group of simple, ordinary shepherds watching their flocks. That's where we pick up the story in Luke chapter 2. There were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. They freaked out. Angels didn't appear to shepherds. They didn't know what was happening. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. What an incredible gift and remarkable promise. Jesus is for everyone. His joy is for all. I I don't know what Christmas looks like for you this year, but I can guess it looks different from other years. Through it all, I pray you experience the joy the angel promised, the joy only Jesus can give. And now I want to show you something else about the angel's statement that makes it even more meaningful. The angel said, do not be afraid. I bring you good news. In those days, the important good news referred to the Roman Emperor Augustus. He brought peace to the empire. He was hailed as a savior. In fact, his birth was declared as the birth of a God and the beginning of good news for the world. That was the Roman version of a savior. And knowing that context makes the angel's announcement even more meaningful. The angel announced the arrival of someone far better. Today in the town of David, a savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. Other versions say he is the Messiah, the Lord. He is the one you've been waiting for. Jesus, the Messiah, is higher and greater than any ruler of this world, than any emperor. As far as we know, the shepherds weren't looking for a savior that night. They were just watching their sheep. We don't know why the message came to them, but they were the very first to hear the announcement. God's plan for them and for all mankind Today in the town of David, a savior has been born to you. He's Christ the Lord. The Jews needed a savior, a deliverer. They'd been captive for almost 700 years. But why do you need a savior? What is so significant about a savior being born? Well, the Bible says heaven is a perfect place. There's no sadness, no sorrow, no sin, no sickness, no problems, no pressures. Heaven is a place of absolute perfection. That means only perfect people get to go to heaven. If God let imperfect people into heaven, it wouldn't be perfect anymore. It'd be like earth. So there are two ways to get to heaven. One of them is to be perfect. Never sin, never think a bad thought, never do a bad thing, never say a bad word to anybody, always be unselfish, never hurt anyone intentionally or unintentionally in your entire life. That would be like playing professional baseball and batting a thousand for your career, never striking out. That would be like never missing a shot in basketball for your whole career or bowling a 300 game every game for your entire life. That would be like me playing 18 holes of golf and my score being 18. That would be you obeying every traffic rule, fully stopping at every stop sign, never changing lanes without a turn signal, never going even one mile over the speed limit, always for your entire driving life. Come on, you didn't do that on the way here. You didn't even do that from the highway to here. Being perfect would be like never missing a question on any test ever. 4.0 GPA, 36 on the ACT, 100% on every quiz, every paper, every assignment, every test, even your driver's license test, forever. And if by chance you could do that, if you could live an absolutely perfect life when you died and you stood before God and he said, why should I let you to heaven? You would say, because I'm perfect. And God would respond, you're right, you're it. Come on in. But you lost that chance a long time ago. So did I. So God said, since none of you are perfect, since you can't possibly earn your way into heaven, here's what I'll do. I'll come to earth in the form of a baby. I will live the only perfect life. I will die on a cross to pay for all the imperfections you have. And then if you will trust in me, I will get you into heaven on my goodness since you can't possibly be good enough. Roy Lesson wrote, if our greatest need had been information, God would have sent us an educator. 
If our greatest need on earth had been technology, God would have sent a scientist. If our greatest need had been money, God would have sent an accountant. If our greatest need had been pleasure, God would have sent us an entertainer. But our greatest need was forgiveness. So God sent us a savior. God came to earth as a man. He came to ordinary people. But most importantly, he came for you. He came to be your savior. You can only have a savior if you recognize your need for one, that you can't save yourself. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. Jesus is God's gift to you. It's a free gift. It's one you'll never earn and can't possibly deserve. I'm not talking about a religion. It's a relationship with Jesus. He wants you to know him personally. Thousands of years before you were born, God knew you'd be listening today. So he could get your attention for just a few moments and say, you matter to me. I have a plan and I have a purpose for your life. I, I know you feel lost and I know you feel forgotten. I know you feel overlooked. There's not a place for you. But I came to earth 2,000 years ago. I grew up, I died on the cross for you. That's my gift to you. And all you have to do is accept that and trust that and follow me. And when you do, we'll develop a relationship and I'll be with you the rest of your life. Perhaps the greatest promise in the Bible is found in the book of John. It's the simple story of salvation, but the most powerful promise of Christmas, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever, that's anyone, whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world but to save the world through him. God sent Jesus for you to pay the price for your sin and to be your savior so you could have everlasting life. What an incredible, amazing gift. Would you bow your heads with me? And maybe you're here today or you're watching online. You say, Pastor Rod, I, I need to receive that gift. I need a savior. I have missed the chance at perfection long, long ago. And I've been hoping I, that I'd make it to heaven on my goodness. And I recognize now there's no way that my only hope is a savior. I want to pray for you. I'm just going to pray right where you're at today. If you're watching online and say, Please pray for me. I need Jesus. I want you to just enter in the chat or click the button for private prayer and one of our pastors will pray with you. Here in this room, would you just raise your hand? I want to pray for you. I need a savior today. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, that now more than 2,000 years ago, you left heaven and came to earth so we could have a savior, the greatest gift. And so we put our faith and our trust in you, knowing that we can never possibly achieve perfection. We trust you and that you paid the price and you made the way for us to enter heaven. And you, you came to earth so we could be in relationship with you, so we could have peace where we've had no purpose, so we could have joy where we've just had discouragement, so we could be saved where we felt so incredibly lost. We thank you for your love and we celebrate that this Christmas in Jesus' name, amen. One of the ways we celebrate God's gift is by taking communion together. In a few moments, we're going to do that. If you're watching online, I want you to go get something for you and your family to take communion. It doesn't have to be grape juice and bread, that's tradition. Get whatever you have. I, you say, well, how can, now, Communion isn't significant because of what you eat and drink. It's important because of what it represents. The body and the blood of Jesus, his sacrifice. 
Jesus came as a gift, but he came for a purpose. He lived to die. 33 years after his birth, Jesus stretched out his hands on a cross. They nailed him to it, and he paid for my sins and for yours. And that's the greatest gift. He came, he lived, and he died, and he lives again. Jesus rose from the dead. And because he did, we don't just tell a story. We don't just remember a great man or a wonderful teacher, but a risen Savior. Our ushers are coming to distribute the elements of communion. I encourage you to to take one, hold it. In a few moments, I'll come back and we'll thank God together and we'll take it together. Hey, listen, you don't have to be a member of our church to receive communion. We're just celebrating together God's most precious gift.
road. The, for I received from the Lord what I passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. When he'd given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And the piece of bread you hold in your hand is a symbol. What it symbolizes is the body of Jesus you, that was broken. You say, well, why is that so, so significant? Isaiah said, by his stripes we are healed. Jesus took pain and suffering so I, he could identify with your pain and suffering. He took all that sickness and pain upon him so he could bring healing to you. There's maybe never been a time where America was more focused on the need for healing. And I wanna pray for you. I wanna pray for our nation today, for the healing power of Jesus to touch you. In Jesus' name, Lord, we come to you today so thankful for your sacrifice. We thank you for Christmas. We thank you that you left heaven and came to earth. But Lord, we thank you for Calvary, that you paid the price for us. We are so grateful to you, Lord. Thank you that you took sickness and sorrow and pain and sadness on yourself so you could not only identify with us, but you could bring healing and restoration. And I pray right that in Jesus' name. I pray, Lord, for people who need a touch of healing in their body. I pray for my friends that are home right now with COVID and struggling. I pray that the healing virtue of Jesus would invade their household. Lord, I pray for my friends in the hospital today, and I pray for healing and strength to return in the name of Jesus. Lord, we pray for this nation desperately in need of a healing miracle and believing that you are the God that does miracles. Lord, I pray for people who have broken hearts today. You are the healer of broken hearts. Bring restoration. Lord, I pray in place of sorrow and sadness, you would bring the joy and healing only you can give. We remember your sacrifice as we eat this bread together in Jesus' name. Paul wrote, in the same way after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant, my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. The cup of juice or whatever liquid you hold in your hand, again, is a symbol. What it symbolizes is what's so important. It symbolizes the blood of Jesus. You say, why was that important? The Bible says without the shedding of blood, there's no remission or forgiveness of sin. In the Old Testament, you had to bring a sacrifice. You, for whatever sin you committed, you had to figure out what was the appropriate sacrifice. You had to bring animals and offer them as a sacrifice to God. Blood had to be shed, the blood of those animals. When Jesus came and when he hung on the cross, he became the once and forever sacrifice and that old system was abolished and you no longer have to figure out the price that you have to pay for sin. Instead, you can put your trust in the price that he paid for sin. His bloodshed is forgiveness for us. And his forgiveness is full and rich and free. And I want to pray for you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for your forgiveness. Thank you for grace. Lord, thank you that we no longer have to see ourselves through the prism of our failures and faults. But instead, we can stand before you clean. We no longer have to figure out what sacrifice, what price we have to pay because you paid the price. We thank you for that price, for your all-sufficient sacrifice that still today is more than enough to provide for our forgiveness. Lord, we, we pray that forgiven, that we would forgive. And in a time in our nation where anger and hate and Discord and division is, seems to be at an all-time high. We pray, Lord, for the forgiveness of Jesus. Lord, that we would, having been forgiven, we would treat others as forgiven. 
We thank you for your sacrifice and we remember it as we drink this juice together. In Jesus' name. And now, Lord, we, we worship you. Come on, would you do that with me? Just thank him in Jesus' name. We thank you, Lord, for your sacrifice. You're a good God. And you're worthy of glory and honor and praise, Lord. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name.